Hi, I entitled this Jewish Grandmothers in New York City and, Fa and Fish Tapeworms, a tale of tapeworm transfer from Scandinavia to the U.S. Midwest to the U.S. East Coast and a specific cooking method. And this is based on uh, an excerpt out of a book called New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers, Tales of Parasites and People by the late, great Robert Desowitz. So just a little bit of history before we get into the meat of it. The European migration to the United States, right? Many Europeans ended up in the um, Northeast and some end, ended up in the, uh, the French, for example, ended up a lot in the areas of New Orleans, up the Mississippi to St. Louis. Um, some Germans also in St. Louis just a variety the Irish and Italians many in New York and Boston and those areas well the Scandinavians uh, were seeking out a place with a similar climate to what they were used to in Europe and many Scandinavians ended up in Minnesota Wisconsin and the Dakotas And the Scandinavian fishermen came to the U.S. in the 1800s to, and they wanted to practice their trade fishing in the cool lake waters of the upper Midwest. And what kind of fish were available there? A, a plethora of freshwater fish like pike and carp, uh, salmon, perch, and pickerel. But they also brought with them a gift uh, from Scandinavia. And while they were out there fishing and they had to do their duty, they deposited this gift in the fresh, cool lake waters of that area. So what does this have to do with Jewish grandmothers? Well, during this time, there was a lot of commerce between the upper Midwest fishermen and the different stores in New York City, where markets had holding tanks full of pickerel and carp and perch that came from the upper Midwest. And the main customers of these fish were often the Jewish housewives and grandmothers who came to make their special dishes. And one of those special dishes was called gefilte fish. And this is basically a ground up concoction of freshwater fish, eggs, matzo meal, salt, and they pressed it into a ball and basically boiled it until done. And this was a a food that was very much in demand during the Jewish Passover and other Jewish holidays. Now preparing this was a learned um, uh, skill and it was tricky because you were basically cooking it until done, you know, with the quotes. And it really depended on instinct and the standards of taste within the family. And the problem then was back in the day, the Jewish grandmothers would sample the fish at different stages uh, during cooking. Thermometers were really high tech back in the, that era. So they would just pick up a little bit of fish here and there, tasting it along the way till they felt like it was done. Um, and there was, a, you know, of course, there was a, a, a pathological issue with that. And we're going to get to that in a second. And the Scandinavians also had a similar constructed dish. Um, they call it fish balls or fiskeballer. So it was often, uh, this uh, disease was often called the Jewish Scandinavian housewife's disease. So what's happening when they, they do something like this? Well, the author, uh, Dr. Robert Desowitz, said in his book, and I quote, Many a nice old lady of Gotham unwittingly acquired a 40-foot Scandinavian immigrant in her digestive tract. So what's a tapeworm? This is what they were, they were contracting a type of tapeworm while they were preparing this um, fish dish. And tapeworms are helminths, uh, parasitic worms um, that live on a host to gain nourishment and protection, while at the same time they cause uh, nutrient absorption, weakness and disease in the host. Uh, there's three main types of helminths. We have the nematodes or the roundworms, the trematodes or the flukes, and the topic of today, the cestodes or the tapeworms. And the tapeworms were flat and ribbon-like, segmented, hermaphroditic, right? They had both sexes, 
and they absorb food through their cuticle. Um, many of them had an intermediate host linked to food. For example, Tania solium uh, would be the pig because it's the pork tapeworm, Tania saginata, the cow or the beef tapeworm, and Diphilobothrium latum, also known as the fish or broad tapeworm. So the general tapeworm morphology, the whole tapeworm is considered uh, basically from the various segments of the proglottids uh, from based on maturity. That would be called the strobola. And then the head is called the scolex. Some scolex, um, many of the scolex on the different tapeworms were had four suckers. Some had hooklets, others did not armed versus unarmed rustellums. And then Diphilobothrium latum was a little bit different in appearance in the scolex area. Then you have the proglottids starting closest to the neck would be the immature proglottids, more mature, and then of course the gravid proglottids where they're just pumping out uh, lots and lots of eggs, tapeworm eggs. Now Diphilobothrium latum, the fish or the broad tapeworm, this has been around for a long time. Um, it's, there's been evidence of Diphilobothrium latum species uh, found in four to 10,000 year old human remains in the western coast of South America. It's native to the cool fresh waters of Scandinavia, western Russia, and the Baltics. Now fish tapeworm infection is distributed worldwide in the subarctic and temperate regions. It's associated with eating of raw or improperly cooked freshwater fish. Uh, some of the most recent data indicate that about 20 million people are infected worldwide. And it's the only adult tapeworm of humans that has an aquatic life cycle. And it's the largest um, and longest tapeworm found in humans. And it can be up to about 45 or 50 feet long. The scolex is a little bit different than the other tapeworms and hence the name Diphilobothrum. It's got two suckers on it and it kind of looks like a spoon, it has a spoon shaped appearance. The proglottids are wider than they are long, hence the nickname broad tapeworm. And they have a rosette uh, uterus. And in, in these um, segments, these proglottids, they are just loaded with eggs. The, the male and female genitalia are in there and they're producing lots and lots of eggs. And the general life cycle is as such. So you'd have the uh, Scandinavian fishermen uh, fishing out in the freshwater lake um, has to go, defecates in the water, the unembryonated egg is passed in the feces where it embryonates in the water the Coracidia hatches and swims around and finds its way into a crustacean. And then it goes through a little cycle in the crustacean. And that swims around and it's typically picked up by a small freshwater fish. Well, you know, something small, maybe like a minnow or something. That's not something that people are going to be eating. However, these little minnows and other small freshwater fish are swimming around and they get eaten up by a predator fish like the carp or the perch or these other fish that I mentioned earlier. And then the person eats the raw or undercooked infected fish and gets the parasite. Now the pathology of Diphilobothrium latum, typically they're asymptomatic. If you have maybe just one worm, you may not even know you have it. Uh, if there are symptoms, it may include abdominal discomfort. Remember, this is a very large tapeworm, you know, uh, up to 45, 50 feet long, possibly. So you could have abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, vomiting, and weight loss. Uh, perhaps the most um, recognized pathology of Diphilobothrium latum is vitamin B12 deficiency, leading to pernicious anemia. Other complications because of its large size would include intestinal obstruction. Now the diagnosis of Diphilobothrium latum is the egg stage um, and they are about 
60 to 70 microns by about 45 or 50 microns. They're a percolated at one end, which is a percolatum is a, like a little lid uh, where the, um, the uh, parasite will come out of the egg. And at the aboopercular end or the opposite end is a little kind of inconspicuous little knob. Sometimes you can't see it. It's barely discernible. So who's at greatest risk of infection? Well, infection generally occurs in the northern hemisphere, Europe, uh, some of the um, uh, northern states of Russia, some North America, um, and uh, northern Asia. There has been cases reported in Uganda and Chile. Fish infected with Diphilobothrium larva may be transported to and consumed in any area of the world. So you got to remember that. Uh, treatment and prevention, it, it is treated by a very common anti-helminth drug called, pro, called Praziquantel. And there's another drug called Niclosamide. Uh, however, this drug is not available in the U.S. So how to prevent Diphilobothrium latum? It's really simple. Do not eat raw or undercooked fish. So if the fish is lightly salted or smoked or pickled but not fully cooked, you are still at risk for catching this parasite. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration recommends the following for fish preparation or storage to kill parasites. You can cook it fully and adequately um, until it reaches an internal temperature of at least 145 degrees Fahrenheit. You can freeze it at minus four degrees Fahrenheit for at least seven days, at minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for about 15 hours. So those, those are some ways to prevent diphilobothrum. Basically, don't eat raw or undercooked fish. And again, this was kind of tailored out of a book um, entitled New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers by Robert Desowitz. And I will link to that below. So if you want to check it out, it, he writes these fascinating books of uh, diseases and, and, and stories and history. And uh, they're really, really uh, worth checking out. So I encourage you to check these books out. I'll put some of them uh, below in the um, description. And I hope you enjoy this. And uh, like it, subscribe to the page, share it with your friends, and I'll see you next time.